Me, Tsika, what a joy it is to cook in my kitchen. Today, we're going to make pasta alla arrabbiata. If you're looking for something spicy, this is your pasta. Salsicce brasate con broccoli e pepperoni. Basically, braised sausages with peppers. And banana cream pudding. Simple, easy to make, and it tastes fantastic. And today you will learn how one of my family members thought that Brooklyn was named after broccoli. Hey, come for the recipes. Stay for the story. I remember my mother going to shop for uh, veggies and holding them and then smelling them and then putting it to a ear. And I, once I asked her, Mama, ma, perché fai così? Why do you do this? She says to me, I'm listening to the song they're singing to me. Now, I know that she was making this up, or maybe she wasn't, but I'm in my mid-50s now, and I still find myself going to the supermarket, and as I pick my tomatoes, my onions, almost instinctively, I do the same thing. I smell it, I put it to my ear, and then I put it in the basket. There was a little girl at the market not too many days ago, and she saw me shopping, and she said, Mommy, Mommy, why is the man listening to the tomato? <laughs> that was at the moment I realized <laughs> I've become my mom. Yeah, I do the same thing. Pasta alla rabbiata is one of the easiest dishes to make. First and foremost, you need to understand how the ingredients come together, the sequence, what they do. Once you understand the secret of pasta alla rabbiata, in spite of the fact that it's as simple as one, two, three, this will become for you your own signature dish. First and foremost, you go with extra virgin olive oil. Why extra virgin olive oil? Very simple. The olive oil becomes part of this whole sauce. We add red pepper flakes. A pinch is just to make it somewhat spicy. A second pinch makes it spicy. At this point, every time I make this at home, I am ordered to stop. Since my wife is nowhere around, <laughs> the Stellino style, one more pinch of red peppers. The reason why I like to use pepper flakes is because this way you can control the amount. Old school in Sicily, when my mom or my dad used to make it, we used to have a big bushel of dried red peppers that crack a little piece and put it in there. Now, as soon as this oil becomes hot, the next thing we're going to do is add the garlic. You need to have nice and thick garlic because this will brown on the outside and still will stay soft on the inside. The next addition is minimally explosive. Chopped parsley. The reason why we add it to the olive oil is very important. First, we want the parsley to fry into the olive oil and to give it its own flavor, creating a base that really makes it nice and strong. Second, what it does for us, it brings down the temperature of the olive oil allowing us to put the other ingredients, tomato sauce, and you can use my tomato sauce that I make, or you can buy it from the store. Choose your favorite brand. You also need to add a little bit of chicken stock. Why? If you were to add only tomato sauce, as the tomato sauce reduces, it becomes thicker and thicker and thicker, almost to a point that it could become gummy. And if you don't want to use chicken stock, an alternative is to actually add some water in which you have cooked the pasta. Especially for those of you that keep a, a vegetarian diet, which is quite intense, this is an excellent way to get around it and still maintain the wonderful flavor that the sauce would give you. Oh, mamma mia, this is beautiful. It's now time for us to add the pasta. This pasta is cooked only three quarters of the way uh, to a stage known as al dente and beyond, meaning that right now is fairly raw. We want the pasta to finish cooking inside the sauce. Why is this important? Imagine the sauce and the pasta to go to a dance together. And the sauce now is looking at the pasta and say, you're beautiful. The pasta say, I think you're the same. And now they're dancing. The moment these ingredients fall in love is the moment they taste great. There is something that I do that keeps me connected to the pasta. It kind of makes me feel there's an exchange of feeling between me and the pasta sauce. The simple movement allows me to really understand when it's time right. Now, watch this. This is the part that I love. There is a glazing that is forming on top of the pasta. As you can see, a sheen to say, this is not just a pasta. This is a miracle. This is a byproduct of human passion. Without passion, you cannot do anything. Without passion, you cannot cook. And if you have none, this is the sauce that will teach you how to be passionate. Take a look at this. Now, the pasta and the sauce are cooked just the right moment. And the next addition that I'm going to make is the addition of cheese. What cheese? Traditionally, 
The cheese that belongs to this pasta is not Parmigiano, rather is Romano cheese. I want the Romano cheese to melt. But you notice that I turn off the heat. Why? If you keep the heat from underneath hot, especially if, unlike me, you have a pan that's made of stainless steel without a non-stick surface, the cheese will stick to the bottom of the pan. This is one good way of having the cheese melt become part of the sauce without burning and without sticking to the bottom of the pan. Look what a beautiful color. I love this. This, this is a painting as far as I'm concerned. We're ready to serve it now. Why do I love pasta so much? I say, well, two things about pasta. I love to eat it, but even more than that, I love to plate it. A little masterpiece that you can do at home. Anytime you're hungry and you think you have nothing in the kitchen. And yet, these little ingredients will create for you the most beautiful reality that you could have ever hoped inside your kitchen, on your dinner table, and at home. This is a dish that you measure by the width of the smiles of the people who eat it. And there you are, pasta, alla rabbiata. I had just returned back from my first year in America, and the whole family uh, was invited over. Actually, we went to one of our cousin's house in the town of Alcamo. And everybody was asking me, what is it like? Is it like in the movies? Like we see it, is it this, is it that? And I was telling story, tall tales, most of them. Yeah, I, I like to embellish. Until my uncle Mimi, Domenico was his name, or we called him Mimi, came to me and says, I know America, I got cousins there too. They live a broccolini. I says, in the town of broccolini? Yeah, it's uh, New York, broccolini. They, they make a broccoli over there, so they call it broccolini. I go, you mean Brooklyn? Hey, broccolini, what did I say? No, you say broccolini, it's called Brooklyn. Brooklyn, broccolini, the same thing. You should see what these people are able to do with the broccolini. They saute with the garlic. It was at the moment that I understood that I am no different than my relatives. Salsicce brasate con i broccoli e peperoni. It's a mouthful, isn't it? What does it mean? Basically, translated from Italian, it means braised sausages with broccoli and peppers. What I love about this recipe is that first of all, most is something that everybody can do. It's a one pot dish. So the one time that you come home, you don't know what to make. You're too tired to make reduction sauces, mashed potatoes, baked potatoes. Take a look at this. This is one of these recipes that makes everybody happy. Plus, it's a sneaky way to get your children to eat broccoli. Let me show you. Got the oil nice and hot and the first thing that we're going to do we're going to add the sausages so one at a time place them into the oil the reason why we do this is because we want the sausages to brown and hold their shape so that throughout the braising process they will still keep this wonderful oval football like shape and what i like to do is to darken them on one side and then to turn them and darken them on the other side at the same time as the sausages are cooking through the oil right now one of the great things that's happening they are basically infusing the olive oil with their own flavor, which ultimately will be absorbed by all the other ingredients. The sausages are brown exactly to where we want them to go, but remember, they're still raw on the inside. We've just browned the outside. I'm going to take the sausages out of the pot, and I'm gonna put them here in this pan, waiting on the side. And the reason why I like to do it this way is because this way they will rest, they will drip away, and they will be out of our hand immediately when we want to add them back into the mix, because we will add them back into the mix. Then the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to start out with garlic, nice and thick. Why? Very important for us that the garlic be cut thick because all throughout the process, the garlic will braise into the olive oil. If we cut it too fine, uh, if we chop it up, it would burn and it would turn basically the sauce all to the other side and it's not going to be a pleasant one. Together with the garlic, we're going to go with onions. Now, these onions are red onions and they're cut into a style known as grossulano. What does that mean? Grossolano means uh, improvised, country style, uh, farmhouse. It means that there's not a great deal of refinement uh, in the finesse in which it's cut. And yet, what I find that in this lack of refinement within the context of the cut, the onion tastes slightly different when they're cut this way. Together with the onion, also for color and for flavor, we're gonna add some red pepper, red bell pepper. What I've done with this, I have cut it in just about the same dice as the onion. We have no seeds and these flavors are coming together in a wonderful way. But what I'm going to do at this point, just to kick it up a little bit, just to give it some more flavor, is add a little bit of red pepper flakes, a typical Sicilian thing. And for those of you who have watched my show over the last 20 years, you know, me and red pepper flakes, we have a love affair. So at this point, as the onions start to soften up a little bit, the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to reinsert the sausages back into the pot. 
Why are we doing this? We want to use the juices from the sausages as they will start leaking into the uh, other ingredients as a flavor factor, a very important flavor factor. There's a lot of salt, there's a lot of pepper in them. There is this wonderful combination of spiciness that's gonna be attracting it all. And at the very beginning in this process is where all of this becomes important. The big pieces that you see with the onions and with the peppers will give us a finish that I like a la contadina, so to spoken. What that means is that the onions will not disappear. If I was to cut these onions and this pepper, they're very fine in finite dice. They will still taste great, but you will not see them in the finished product. But this is how it used to be made in my family, and this is how I like to make it when I make it for myself, and still to maintain this one dish capability. You can see how the onions are starting to pick up the color as they're cooking in there, the olive oil, the peppers, the aroma. I wish that the camera was able to capture the aroma that is starting to generate out of this. And talking about aroma, is we're going to imbue all of these flavors with a little bit of white wine. People often ask me, what kind of wine do you use? You can use any wine you want. Whatever is your favorite white wine, it's great. And we're gonna cook this until the wine reduces down to a glaze. In the making of this dish, there are two schools of thought. One is to actually take the broccoli florets and to parboil them for about four or five minutes so that they harden up before you add them to the dish. However, the way in which I look at it is slightly different. Instead of putting the whole florets where I do, I cut the florets into smaller pieces and I like to add them now into the mix so that they pick up the flavor of all the ingredients that are in there, especially these wonderful juices that are being leaked out right now from the sausages. Most people have issues when it comes to broccoli. I know, I was one of those people. But there is something that happens in this mix as the broccoli and the sausages cook together as they exchange this flavor. This dish really is a political ploy. It's a political ploy in which uh, ingredients that truly seemingly do not belong with each other suddenly find the perfect combination. The next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to add some stock. Let's talk about the stock. I prefer to add chicken stock. Why? I like chicken stock because chicken stock has not what I would refer to a dominant flavor. By a dominant flavor, it means something that could completely overtake the dish. Rather, it adapts itself to whatever other flavors into the base of the dish that we're cooking. Now, we're gonna let this come to a boil. Once it reaches a boil, we're gonna lower it down to a simmer. Now, we have simmered this for a good 35, 40 minutes by simmering it. What happens, the fat that's trapped inside the sausages slowly starts to melt and go into the sauce, making the sauce even the much more flavorful. But what I'm about to show you now is a secret that very few people know, and I think you're going to love to. Now, take a look at how nice and reduced everything is. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the heat altogether so there is no heat underneath. And then, in the very hot mixture underneath, I add a dollop of softened butter. Why do I do this? This is nothing more than an ego play. <laughs> what I love about the butter is that as the butter melts into the sauce, it thickens up the sauce, giving it this wonderful glow to it, and also adds this great, fantastic flavor. But together with the butter, there's another thing that I love, and I have to show you what that is. You can use any kind of cheese you want. Parmigiano is what my wife prefers, but me, I love pecorino. And pecorino because it's very reminiscent of Sicily for me, and also has a stronger flavor, which in my opinion, really, it's the perfect complement to this. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. Salsicce brasate con i peperoni e i broccoli. This is too beautiful. Well, we're ready to play. Let me show you how to do it. This is a very simple dish that more often than not people consider to be nothing more than something that belongs to a farm, something that a farmer would love, not an elegant dish. To me, on the other hand, this particular dish is so loaded with flavors that it's unbelievable. Using a slotted spoon, what I'd like to do is take all the veggies that we have braised in there and put them on the side, just like this, so that you have the side. And then, using a nice, wonderful sauce spoon, here's what I'm gonna do next. You're gonna love this. Here's what I love with the sauce. Watch the sauce coming down. This is the butter that has thickened up, the cheese that's holding it together, and every bite that you take with this particular dish at this point is absolutely spectacular. A lot of people will tell you, oh, let's add some parsley, let's put some extra cheese. You need absolutely nothing. This is what perfection is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how you make sausages 
braise with broccoli and peppers. I might have a more elegant way of speaking, but I am just as excitable as they are. Because the first thing that my cousin and my uncles could think about it was the fact that in America there is a town that is named after the broccoli. And to them was okay. They said to themselves, if Americans can name a town after food, Broccolini to be exactly, it's gotta be a beautiful place to be in it. Banana cream pudding. I'd like to tell you it's a Sicilian recipe, but that would be a lie. I learned this in Texas during my first book tour many, many, many years ago. The recipe I'm gonna show you today has a lot of uh, Stalinisms attached to it. It's very simple to prepare and it tastes great. Let me show you how to make it. First, we want to start with some softened butter, and we're gonna get this butter to melt. The most important thing is to almost make like a caramel before you add the bananas. So the first thing that you want to do is to make sure that the butter melts, and then we will add the sugar. You see the bubbles in the butter, that's when I like to add the sugar. People always ask me, how much sugar are you supposed to handle? I say, a lot. What is the meaning of a lot? Usually I almost do equal amounts of sugar and butter. So let's mix this together. Always like to have an extra bit of sugar on the side just in case I should need it. And then on medium high heat, you cook this and you bring it exactly to the perfect browning. You have to be patient and you have to move quickly to make sure that the sugar and the butter mixture do not stay on the same spot in the pot for too long, otherwise they will burn. The time is right now for us to add the bananas. What I've done with the bananas, I have cut them in small dice. And now, I wanna make sure that we mix everything perfectly. The bananas still have a little bit of water on the inside, but what's happening right now, they're marrying together with the sugar and the butter, and they're cooking down to a cream-like state. The consistency that I have is a very gifted consistency for us because when we'll add it inside the pudding, you will have this wonderful soft banana cream-like together with the vanilla pudding. It's a combination that's special. And then, then I have a secret ingredient I'm gonna show you too. Look how gorgeous that is. There's one last addition that we need to make. At this point, what I like to do is to lower the heat and we add rum. You can add any kind of liquor you want. You can also do without the liquor. I like to add it just because it makes it more fun for me. And then stir until most of the rum has evaporated. What the rum is doing right now is adding liquid to the mixture, is also adding a unique flavor of its own, giving to this mixture exactly what we're looking for. We're done. Turn off the heat and let it rest. I've just added the half and half to another pot on the stove next to me, and while the half and half is getting hot, let me show you how to handle the dry ingredients. First, we start with the egg yolks, egg yolks only. So here we go with it. Now, next to the egg yolks, we're gonna put some flour. And together with the flour, we're also going to put some cornstarch. And then, just to be sure, just a tiny bit of sugar, a little bit of sugar, just because sugar is wonderful. And to make sure that we also have a wonderful vanilla base on this, a little bit of vanilla extract as well. Then using a whisk, you mix all this together. Why are we mixing this? This will create for us exactly what we need, the binding agent that will give not only life, but also the texture to the very dish that we're about to make. The flour, and the cornstarch, once connected with the hot half and half, will expand and it will create this bonding effect. Now, the dry ingredients have mixed perfectly. I can see that the cream is getting to the heat that we want. And before I proceed with the step, because I need to be attentive to what I do, I want to tell you what I'm about to do. We're doing something called tempering. Really, what we want to do is to add the hot uh, half and half to the dry ingredients. If we add it all at once, 
we might end up actually making scrambled eggs. And this is something that you really want to pay the most attention. So by adding it in a thin stream and then whisking as you go at it, you basically give the opportunity to the dry ingredients to slowly react to it. And then when we put them back into the pot, we'll be able to control the expansion that they have as they get this wonderful pudding-like texture. Mamma mia, I went on forever. How about I show you? All right, here we go. Wish me luck. A little bit at a time. Thin stream. And as you add it, make sure that you incorporate it immediately. You want to add all of it in it because we're going to put it back into the pot and we're going to bring it to the consistency that is perfect for our pudding. And you have to be muscular like me, strong. For making pudding, you gotta go to the gym for two reasons. One, because you need to be as strong as I am too, <laughs> to make sure that you stay in shape after you eat the amount of pudding that you will, and you will. This is the most difficult part of it all. You need to pay attention to what's happening. You need to have your eye on the ball. I have the heat underneath on medium. I like it on medium versus high because I can control more the content of the pot as it becomes thick. There are three elements in here that we need to watch. The most important one right now is the eggs. You can see my eye shifting back and forth between here and you. Why? You want to pay attention to what happens because the eggs will turn on you quite quickly. They could turn into scrambled eggs. A technique that's almost fail-proof is to do this on a double boiler, but if you're going to do it on a double boiler, that's too safe. When you live, take risks. And this is one of the my favorite risks. Now, remember also we have the flour that you want to somehow cook completely into this process. And then we have the cornstarch. The cornstarch is the most important one. It needs a certain temperature before the molecules of the cornstarch expand and they thicken up the content of what we have in the pan. Meanwhile, almost at the same time, also the egg, the egg yolks, because we don't have any egg whites, will thicken up. So keep your eyes on the ball and attentively keep stirring. Now, let's pay attention to what's happening. We have the perfect consistency. The last step that I want to do is to strain it. You may ask yourself why. Well, it makes it smoother to begin with, and I like a very fine mesh. And the reason why I like a very fine mesh is because even the smallest of pieces that's still somewhat solid, and it could be maybe some cornstarch that has hardened up, or a little clump of uh, flour will be smoothed out, and that's very important for the final taste. At this point, help yourself with a tool similar to this that allows you to push everything right through the strainer, exactly this way. And you will see that the hard pieces will be left behind, giving you this wonderful, smooth finish that you're looking for. Smooth, in this case, is king. The next thing that we need to do is to assemble the dessert. It's a very unique plating technique, and I want to show you exactly how to do it. When it comes to assemble the dessert, you need to have in front of you all the tools that will make it just right. And transfer the mixture in this because it has a spout and will give me precise direction. If you're doing this for a large group of people, you will find this little bit of a technique to be most, most helpful. So do the first layer just like this. Here, I show you a layer with the technique. Then, on top of this, what we have here, in, it's vanilla wafers. And we're gonna create here a little coating right on top of the first layer. This coating has two purposes. It creates a division and then also acts as a bedding on top of which we are going to put our banana mixture, right like this. Go with this, then you cover the whole bit with some more of the vanilla wafers, and then you go and you top it off and you create the first serving. So you go around it. As you can see, the smoothness of what we created by straining it before is now becoming apparent. And this is the difference between a pudding, just the pudding, and then this pudding. At this point, what I like to do is take some more of the crumbled wafer and put it right here. When I tried it for the first time, instead of this, they actually had the whole wafer, which is quite good. You can do it that way if you want to, but that's not the way I prefer doing it. And then the last thing that we want to do is just add some whipping cream to it. And there you are. This is how you make 
banana cream pudding, an old recipe reinterpreted with just a little bit of panache. So that's how I went down the one time. We told stories, I told tall tales. I told everybody that I was an astonishing football player. They believe me, they don't need to know. We had broccolini that night and pasta and grilled sausages. We made my grandma's cake. There was a lot of wine going. Yeah. That's how it went.